Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ramser and, and Dr. Riviescu for the invitation to participate of this uh, journal club. As we were saying, uh, you know, as the enterprise integrates across service lines, uh, this is a great opportunity to share experiences, knowledge and, 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 and best practices. So uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to present on behalf of, of our team here in Florida. And, and the topic that uh, is of interest uh, for us and, and, and is uh, regarding the application of mechanical circulatory support in, in post-cardiotomy cardiogenic shock, which is a terrible situation for most surgeons uh, who have at any point experienced it in the career, and, and the alternatives and how the knowledge is evolving. So we are going to be discussing two main papers, but we are going to be discussing the topic at large. Uh, so I would like to start by introducing, uh, we have a pretty busy agenda, but we, we'll get through this, trust me. I would like to to share with you. I believe someone may need to mute. So just, just as a reminder, if you're not speaking, please mute your microphones. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to share with you a little bit of uh, the, the program here in Cleveland Clinic, Florida. To begin, uh, we cover the area of South Florida with roughly six and a half million people covering mainly the, 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 the east side and, and, and progressively extending towards the, the west side. And so uh, the Cleveland Clinic, Florida is composed of five hospitals, roughly a little over a thousand beds, 130 ICU beds, and three of the hospitals offer a cardiac surgery in Weston, uh, Martin Health, and Indian River, with a volume of roughly 1,000 open heart surgeries uh, a year. And uh, the Acute Mechanical Circulatory Support Program is under the umbrella of the Heart and Vascular Institute, but definitely uh, uh, with participation of, uh, of a dedicated multidisciplinary team that brings the best uh, to the table for on behalf of the care of these patients. So um, we're going to take two minutes to review evolving concepts in cardiogenic shock. And um, basically with the definition that's always elusive, but is certainly a cl clinical syndrome of impaired cardiac function with progressively worsen hypoperfusion, hemodynamic ne uh, neurohormonal and metabolic compromise. And the mortality has not significantly changed over the last two decades, remaining solid roughly covering around 40, 50 percent. So when we look at the epidemiology of shock in, in, in our cardiac ICUs, um, and this is uh, from the Critical Care Cardiology Trial Networks, uh, uh, the program there in Ohio is part of, we can see that roughly two thirds of ICU admissions in shock are related to cardiogenic shock. About half of them will be ischemic. And, and then we have a quarter, a little a third, uh, non-ischemic, uh, probably mainly the compensated uh, heart failure and, 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 and mixed etiology. So we can see that, that you know, mainly two significant patterns, the, the patient with, with acute shock, uh, you know, related to, acute, to, to myocardial infarction or, 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 the, or the walking wounded with, with heart failure that will decompensate and rapidly progress into cardiac shock. So with this sort of two phenotypes here, the patient that has a, an acute myocardial infarction but was previously well will develop severe hypotension, acute hypotension with hypoperfusion and progress to tissue congestion, whereas a patient with congestive heart failure will probably live with some degree of congestion and at the time of decompensation progress to hypoperfusion and, and, and significant hypotension with progressive shock, right? And so when we look at the spectrum of cardiogenic shock, we see that there is not, of all the clinical classifications and, and strategies, maybe not a single one that can be applied to all forms of cardiogenic shock. If anything, I think, and we'll get back to this later, the most recent classification of, uh, of shock by, by the uh, Society of, of um, Cardiovascular Angiography and Intervention, uh, may, may, may be of more uh, clinical value. What we know, though, is that as there is progressive uh, compromise and of, of organ dysfunction, uh, the mortality uh, rises exponentially. And so uh, this is sort of a summary of the, the 
hemodynamic um, equation uh, of cardi for cardiogenic shock in which uh, we see that it's important to provide, you know, circulatory support, definitely decompression and ventricular support, optimize coronary perfusion and decompression and perfusion of the rest of the organs. And this is timely sensitive in the sense that uh, uh, delaying diagnosis and, and stratification and eventually the right therapy will lead to severe increase in, 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 in Immortality, and we see, you know, from different experiences, uh, once that the for perfusion is compromised and there is lung congestion, mortality can easily rise to 50% for that patient admitted to the ICU in cardiogenic shock. So, we're learning more and more as we think of hemodynamic profiles in heart failure to think of hemodynamic profiles in cardiogenic shock. And certainly, the hypovolemic is an easy one to diagnose and treat. But then as we progress, it's more important to be able to identify and properly diagnose and treat individual ventricular congestion or biventricular congestion. And what we know is that regardless of the etiology of the shock, when there is compromise of the right ventricle or biventricular compromise, mortality quickly expo uh, rises exponentially. So the, the concept of, of the, emergency, the emergency of shock is evolving and more uh, widely being embraced in the sense that as we have learned the, the importance of door to balloon uh, in, in acute myocardial infarction is the concept of door to support to quickly identify these patients and progress in the therapy and support of these patients. And I, will, I referred earlier to the uh, Society for uh, Cardiovascular and Geography and Interventions uh, regarding the, the new classification uh, for cardiogenic shock, which I think is very important because this is a dynamic process. And we are all familiar with the classic patient in cardiogenic shock that may be on, on a couple of inotropes, eventually some form of acute mechanical support. These patients, you know, will strive to get them out of this and, and move into uh, lower stages and, and, and certainly definitely quick, can quickly deteriorate and progress in their, in, 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 their, in their stage. And what we see as we step up in, in the number of drugs of the diseases that are required and the patients progress in their stage, mortality increases exponentially and the chances of native health recovery and survival uh, decrease also exponentially. So, well, you are all familiar with, with general aspects of, of ECMO support, but definitely being this a topic we'll review and, you know, the, the basic components of the ECMO circuit with the, with the, with the drainage line, the, 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 the four pump, uh, the membrane line, and, and then the, the return uh, line that will be depending on where we, the form of support we establish will be connected on a big, large artery or vein. And uh, actually, the, the new uh, microporous uh, polymethylpentane hollow fibers can be very handy uh, for the membrane oxygenators and have been adopted widely because they have the best efficiency for gas exchange. And, and, and the less, uh, let us say, uh, resistance to, to blood flow. So depending on what time of cannulation we can drain from the large vein and return to another large vein for veno venous support or to, to a large artery for veno arterial uh, support that will provide respiratory and hemodynamic support simultaneously. And the goals of ECMO therapy will depend uh, certainly for veno venous and veno arterial we can have the option to bridge to recovery ideally eventually to transplant and also in veno arterial we have other forms of long-term support that we can consider for these patients and we can see you are all familiar also with this the progressive adoption of of ECMO and application uh, in in the last uh, decade um, in, in, in adult patients, and, and, and we see, uh, you know, when we look at the ELSO, uh, how about half of the patients receiving ECMO uh, are uh, adults. Uh, but strikingly, those patients receiving veno arterial ECMO, either for cardiac support or in the context of EC, ECPR, uh, even more so, will have a, continue to have a, a green prognosis. So now going into some of the literature we wanted to discuss, the first thing is that uh, the guidelines uh, recently published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery recommend uh, the, the, the use of centrifugal pumps uh, for, for support. And we have different consoles with centrifugal pumps uh, 
that have the less friction and, 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 and the better durability, less trauma to, to, to the, the parts. Uh, the integrated portable circuits are supported mainly for transport of the patients, and certainly there is an additional cost to the use of these circuits and the use of oxygenators with polymethylpentane uh, membranes, as we said. Now, in terms of definition of postcardiotomy shock, and now diving into our into our topic, uh, is defined as depressed myocardial contractility with persistent low cardiac output, progressive tissue hypoperfusion, increasing metabolic acidosis, and increasing requirements of inotropic vasopressor support in the context of uh, an open heart operation. So uh, when we think of it, it it's, it's probably not this one or this phenotype. It's probably somewhere in between, or patients may have a component more of, of, of the one or the other phenotype, depending on their previous condition and, and, and the progression of the events uh, during the admission before surgery and during the operation. But what we know is that about the incidence of, of uh, postcardiotomy, cardiogenic shock, is roughly about 1%. Uh, about half of the patients will develop progressive heart failure after winning from cardiopulmonary bypass, and roughly 40% may be failing to win from cardiopulmonary bypass. So, uh, you know, uh, mechanical circulatory support, mainly ECMO, has been used consistently for several decades, but with a much progressive adoption in the last decade, with you know maybe newer technologies easier to apply or wider adoption in general and but in spite of that we see that survival uh, has actually continued to decline and that probably related to several things including you know uh, application of ECMO in, in patients of, of higher risk more challenging cases maybe with a grimmer prognosis uh, rather than an rather than a, a, a problem with, with the management of these patients, probably the application in more challenging situations. There is unique characteristics uh, in the context of post-cardiotomy shock. Um, the first one to consider is that the surgical team is familiar with the patient disease, the comorbidities, and with the longitudinal course of the events uh, uh, through the course of the operation. And the patient, is supported on cardiopulmonary bypass uh, during the previous hours. So in general, will patients will have adequate end organ perf perfusion. Uh, eventually, the insult will be isolated to the heart or, or the heart lungs, at least early uh, as we are trying to come off bypass. Several prognostic scorings have been applied for, 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 for ECMO, but, but actually they don't have a true application in post-cardiotomy shock. Some of them, like the Apache, specifically exclude patients in post-cardiotomy shock, and some others don't necessarily include the physiological changes and, and considerations we describe about uh, the, the, the operations. More recently, it was a report of the Remember score for post-cardiotomy shock patients after cabbage. This is a single center uh, score um, from, from China uh, that uh, seem to represent and to have a good prognostic indicator based on physiologic uh, 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 variables, uh, but still uh, pending uh, you know, external validation, maybe to wider adoption. Now, We've known for over two decades that, that the number of inotropes necessary to separate from cardiopulmonary bypass do relate to a post-operative mortality. And so in this context, different um, basoactive uh, inotropic scores have been developed in the last uh, two decades. The most recent uh, 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 was, uh, let us say, validated by Coponen and, and, and colleagues in over 3,000 patients and proved to have a very good uh, predictive value, as you see here, uh, not only for mortality, but also for complications early after the operation, of course, length of stay and, and, and an eventually mortality early after surgery and mortality uh, up to a year after the operation, particularly uh, increased for patients with a vasoactive inotropic support score or over 30, as you see on this uh, diagram. And we all know when we see this at the bedside of a patient that that's a dear, uh, a, a complex uh, situation with, with high mortality, needless to say. So, so back to the guidelines, 
uh, you know, they recommend a rapid progression in the decision uh, and, and, and the decision to implement mechanical and, 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 and upgrade mechanical support when, when the patient, when we are unsuccessful to win off cardiopulmonary bypass in spite of maximal inotropic support. Why definition there? Uh, certainly, the balloon pump is unsuccessful, and and we don't and, and at early signs of of in organ injury, uh, meaning uh, progressive rising in the in the lactate, and so try to to implement it before the onset of anaerobic metabolism. There is particular situations in which we can also consider uh, mechanical support uh, as a prophylactic sort of measure in, in selected cases, uh, patients that will develop isolated respiratory dysfunction or early after L-body implant or heart transplant in the context of primary graft dysfunction. Certain characteristics have been sort of described consistently uh, uh, associated to postcardiotomic uh, shock. Uh, actually, more oftentimes it's, it's relatively young patients, uh, patients with preoperative renal insufficiency, recent MI, compromise of the left main, or poor left ventricular function. Um, and when we look at the spectrum of patients receiving uh, 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 support uh, after open heart surgery, it's a, it's a wide spectrum that, that encompasses all, all, all uh, current uh, open procedures. Uh, if anything, uh, now the guidelines support the, the institution of, me of acute mechanical support uh, early after an aortic dissection that uh, had been controversial for, for quite some time, but, but experience and, and experts' experience uh, have now agreed to support the application of mechanical support early after aortic dissection as well. <laughs> so there is uh, mainly two uh, broad uh, uh, clinical situations in which we are going to be applying this me mechanical support. Um, basically ECMO. Intraoperative, as uh, patients uh, are failing to win off cardiopulmonary bypass, either to uni or biventricular failure or respiratory failure, or postoperative uh, in patients that develop cardiac arrest in the ICU, develop progressive respiratory failure or intractable arrhythmias. And, and, and the characteristics of the patients will certainly impact the outcome. You know, some of these patients may be with older age, with higher uh, amount of comorbidities, uh, certainly the the uh, some of them may have other circulatory devices at the time, and components of the surgery like the time on cardiopulmonary bypass and so, or eventually um, circulatory arrest may also impact uh, the early postoperative outcome. The controversy uh, around age and some centers have. Uh, cut off ages, or, or we may have cut off ages for ECMO in, in other uh, conditions, for example, ECMO CPR. Now, the elderly patients that go to an open heart operation nowadays, particularly with new guidelines and with adoption of new technology, for example, the opportunity to apply TAVERS or, or uh, we, we reflects in, in, in maybe not so elderly patients going to the operating room or not so frail, in which we have learned more and more to, to be cautious in the indication for the operation in these patients and look for other alternatives. So, uh, you know, uh, the guidelines sort of recommend uh, the, the application or support, the application of, of mechanical support in elderly patients, meaning in the 70s or so, if the myocardial recovery is likely and certainly bring our attention to, to contemplate the frailty of the patients at the time. Another important thing is, is, is to consider the assessment that we do in the operation of the severity of, of shock. And, 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 and when we are going through the process, uh, you know, to try to separate the patient from cardiopulmonary bypass. Definitely, we went over the basopressor inotropic uh, scorings and, 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 and the importance of trying to avoid getting in that situation that we are on high three, two, three drugs at high doses. Uh, but it is true that occasionally, particularly with prolonged uh, pump runs, the patients may be initially be sort of failing to, to, to win from cardiopulmonary bypass and, and uh, transiently with low cardiac output that will resolve as the patient reperfuses and so. The challenge continues to be to determine who will not recover and will benefit from the initial application of, of, of mechanical support. 
Uh, we also need to consider relevant factors re related to comorbidities, uh, to the trajectory of the, po the, the, the bypass, uh, and be very honest in terms of the satisfaction with the procedure that had been performed, uh, you know, whether myocardial recovery had been optimized or not, if there are bleeding concerns that had been addressed as we are going through this process, and the discussions that might have been taken place with the patient or the family before the operation. You know, in, in the context of all this, the timely implantation continues to be critical uh, to the successful outcome. The only, if anything, contraindication uh, supported in, 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 supported in, the, in the guidelines is uncontrolled bleeding. Uh, the others are uh, relative contraindications, and, and if the myocardial recovery is unlikely, we certainly need to factor the, the, the likelihood of the patient being a candidate for replacement therapies, being it heart transplant or, or ELVAD. Um, when we look at, uh, to the guidelines a little more in detail, well, they describe what they, they go in, in, in detail on what we have talked about the early application of support uh, before the development of end organ injury, before the development of um, the onset of anaerobic metabolism to consider the likelihood of native myocardial recovery, as we said, uh, and, and, and consider early application for, for better success. Uh, they certainly, you know, bring our attention to consider comorbidities, advanced age, and so as factors uh, associated with death. Uh, and, and, and in patients with particular uh, poor conditions, uh, structural hemodynamic or metabolic conditions, structural cardiac abnormalities, uh, congenital cases, and so, to maybe consider preoperative implantation of uh, uh, temporary mechanical support to facilitate perioperative peri management. Of course, the type and modality of support will be based on the type of hemodynamic condition and, and the patient's characteristics, right? Regarding right ventricular support, the guidelines uh, talk about the, 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 the or support the application of, of RV, uh, the oxy uh, and, 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 and independent support of the right ventricle in patients with RV dysfunction and, and concomitant respiratory compromise. Uh, also, in all those patients with preoperative lung compromise that might have worsened at the time of the surgery. And, 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 part, and patients going for pulmonary artery embolectomy or endarterectomy or, or on a chronic stage um, that develop early signs of RB failure as we're trying to come off bypass. In terms of the modes and configurations of support, peripheral cannulation can be considered and provide uh, LB or biventricular support. We talk a little bit about the oxy -Arbat that can eventually, as the lungs improve, be uh, we can take out the membrane oxygenator of the circuit and, 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 and make it a pure right ventricular support device. Uh, they support the consideration for alternative uh, artery cannulations like axillary subclavian as an alternative to femoral artery cannulation and the direct cannulation of the LV through the apex uh, for LV drainage and specific conditions. Uh, for example, in the context of uh, a patient with uh, an aortic, uh, a mechanical aortic prosthetic valve. Uh, and then uh, also the, the importance of, to consider hybrid forms of cannulation uh, in patients uh, with cardiac failure and, and differential oxygenation uh, or re specific respiratory failure and insufficient venous range to try to facilitate and, con and, and, and provide a more robust support. In terms of the use of balloon pump and intraortic balloon uh, and an uh, and alternative uh, platforms, uh, the guidelines also support this, the intraortic balloon pump, of course, as a first uh, mode of support uh, when the patients are in progressive in heart failure shortly after winning bypass. Uh, and, and to keep uh, also the balloon as an alternative for decompression in patients with poor or absent uh, aortic valve opening once that we have established ECMO support. And they also endorse the use of transvalvular uh, microaxial devices, um, specifically for patients with severe isolated LV dysfunction or in the context combined with ECMO in patients with, with biventricular support to facilitate LV decompression. This is an early experience, was a feasibility study actually with the use of, of um, the Impella uh, uh, 
the direct insertion in Pella in the aorta and in Pella CP uh, uh, early after in, in patients developing left ventricular uh, dysfunction and failing to come off bypass. That showed a significant hemodynamic benefit and, and, and survival benefit. And actually, uh, there is uh, a new study that will look into this with the application of the Impella 5.5 that is a much more robust pump. In terms of uh, the application of, of, of ECMO uh, early in, in the post-operative period in, in patients developing cardiac arrest in the ICU, uh, which is a, a fear situation, uh, certainly now the societies endorse uh, the, you know, the practice to open the chest in the context of the emergency in the patients that eventually progress in profound uh, hypotension or, or eventually cardiac arrest and, and to implement the, the support with, with ECMO. You know, there are leading uh, causes that, that may be preventable, uh, like high progressive hypoxemia, electrolyte imbalances, and, 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 and maybe progressing and, and, and corrected or trying to avoid them if they identified on time to try to avoid the arrest, where there are others that may be more uh, acute and, and, and may lead to arrest in spite, may not be prevented. Uh, certainly, we know that prompt treatment uh, will improve the, the outcomes, and, and, and very few um, experiences have been published. Eventually, this one uh, from China as well, uh, talking about 50% uh, of, of winning of ECMO and eventually 33% uh, of hospital survival. Now, uh, a fair amount of controversy has developed regarding uh, the, the concept of central versus peripheral cannulation and so. So, uh, more recently, uh, there was an important article that is one of the ones we're going to be discussing. When we look at the different forms of cannulation, and this is just a diagram, central cannulation will be draining from uh, directly from the right uh, atrium and and. and with the cannula directed into the IVC and will be returning to the ascending aorta, providing, if you want, the most robust form of, of, of support and, and certainly the most versatile. Uh, uh, versatile. Um, whereas the peripheral cannulation will be uh, draining and, and returning eventually to either, uh, you know, arteries and veins, either in the groin, in the femoral system or the, or the axillary. Uh, the central venoarterial ECMO is certainly used more frequently in post-cardiotomy shock and in patients, in pediatric patients. Uh, this is uh, an example of, of well, from a, another institution uh, in previous practice, my mind, uh, where a two-year-old child with myocarditis uh, eventually required central cannulation to provide uh, adequate support. Uh, the potential benefits uh, of central cannulation certainly integrate flow, improve cardiac drainage, reduce cardiac compression, multiple options in terms of LV bending, as we'll see. Detrimental is the greater risk of bleeding and the requirement for high blood transfusion. This is another alternative for cannulation in the context of mini, um, minimal invasive access. In terms of peripheral cannulation, uh, it is certainly less invasive, allows for sternal closure, less bleeding and potentially for extubation, definitely is critical to secure the distal arterial uh, perfusion. Detrimental factors are related to suboptimal drainage, suboptimal LV unloading, potential for vascular complications, compromised flows, and potentially Arlequin syndrome as uh, myocardial contractility improves if we still have sort of limited uh, respiratory function. When we look at distal perfusion cannula, it's critical um, to use catheters that are reinforced because uh, the, 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 the regular um, uh, catheters that are used in, in, the, in the cath lab uh, are, you, are, you know, conceived for, for use uh, over the course of a procedure or an intervention, and eventually uh, the Teflon will warm and can kink over time. So this is a large study done uh, that was recently published in, in terms of compare, comparing um, central versus peripheral cannulation to find out if there was an impact in, in outcomes. 
So this is from 19 European and, uh, centers and eventually a couple of centers in Saudi Arabia, where over 18 years, uh, 19 hospitals provided the information of 780 adult patients. And, and they parallel they, they, their analysis, they reported with a parallel systematic review and meta-analysis of almost 2,500 patients. These were uh, adult patients over 18 years of age, all requiring ECMO for postcardiotomy, cardiogenic shock. <clears throat> they did exclude patients that require ECMO post elbat post heart transplant, and eventually procedures on the descending aorta. The primary endpoint was in hospital mortality, and the secondary endpoints, death on vino arterial ECMO, reoperation for bleeding, requirement of blood transfusions, vascular complications, sternal complications, general clinical postoperative complications, and length of ICU stay. When we look at the populations, we see that about two-thirds of the patients received peripheral VA ECMO cannulation, and they were a little slightly older, roughly 64 years of age, where a third of patients require central or receive central venoarterial ECMO, we are slightly younger at 61 years of age. Sex distribution, BMI roughly 26, sex, sex distribution about a third of them were female. About half of the patients require emergency, urgent or emergency procedures, and about a quarter of the patients had severe left ventricular dysfunction. Um, as you see, moderate to high uh, risk for operation, most of the patients. In terms of the indication for surgeries, we see that roughly 45, 50% had coronary artery disease. About um, a third presented aortic valve disease, a third um, mitral valve disease, and roughly 10%, uh, 8% aortic dissection. When we look at the procedures that were done, about half of the patients received coronary bypass surgery, about a quarter aortic valve surgery, about a quarter mitral valve surgery, and roughly here. You can add up here a fifth of the patients receive procedures on the aorta. Remember that this is not exclusive. Patients may receive more than one procedure at a time. And what stood up certainly from the beginning is that patients receiving central venoarterial ECMO had received a longer cardiopulmonary bypass time. So probably these patients, you know, the, the patients that re eventually receive peripheral venoarterial ECMO had been able to win off bypass for the most part. Uh, so whereas the central uh, transition uh, directly to to uh, from the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit to the ECMO circuit. And here we see the descriptions and what we were talking. Um, roughly half of the patients receiving central venous arterial ECMO failed to win from cardiopulmonary bypass. Over half of the patients with peripheral developed progressive heart failure after winning cardiopulmonary bypass. And it's also noticeable that a significant uh, number of the patients receiving peripheral venous arterial ECMO eventually was related to respiratory failure, R ARDS, uh, you know, after winning from cardiopulmonary bypass, some of them early um, in the few days early after they, they had been in the, in the intensive care unit. So when we look at the outcomes, we see that certainly the patients with central venous arterial ECMO presented higher mortality at roughly 72 versus 61 percent, require more reoperations for bleeding and more uh, transfusions of blood. But it's in interesting to see that patients with peripheral uh, VA ECMO presented more liver failure, significant increased vascular access site infection, more sepsis, well, of course, they had longer hospital stay in, in, in the ICU. And um, eventually, uh, about similar number of patients uh, were win or it didn't reach significance, let's say, uh, the number of patients that were win from ECMO. So the summary of the study eventually, you know, when they did all their analysis uh, was that central ECMO was related to higher mortality, as we see higher reoperation for bleeding and requirement of blood transfusions. When they did the subgroup analysis, they all, it all favored peripheral versus central ECMO. And when they look at the mortality across time uh, in, in the studies, uh, they, they also reflected what we had seen from the ELSO database, that mortality remained high. This is over uh, a decade. 
uh, in spite of uh, you know of progressive adoption uh, they they look at, at uh, they did a meta-analysis and eventually ended up uh, with 15 studies, of which only two uh, were multi-center, comparing, uh, you know, uh, peripheral versus central cannulation. But this accounted for roughly 2,500 patients. And, and the 30-day mortality for the whole uh, cohort uh, was 66%. Uh, uh, and when they did the... The, 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 the meta-analysis, uh, you know, uh, peripheral cannulation uh, was uh, slightly better in terms of the outcome in terms to, uh, in comparison to, to central cannulation. Going back to the guidelines, they point out the importance of uh, the, the, the factors to consider when choosing non-conventional uh, post-cardiotomy uh, modes and uh, support, uh, modes and configurations of, of support. Uh, certainly to consider the underlying disease, the, the, the form of, of ventricular dysfunction, we need to optimize ven ven venous drainage <clears throat> and, and, and the output of the device. Consider global cardiac contractility, avoid left chamber stasis and distension and so on, and, and prevent, of course, limb ischemia and hypoperfusion. When we look at the opera, post operative management of, of the patients, uh, we are all familiar with this situation and the challenges of managing the patient in all uh, aspects of the management of the patient that we do very closely with our ICU doctors and, and the, the management of the ECMO or the different uh, platforms of acute mechanical circulatory support that we also manage um, uh, together. Uh, Initially, after uh, the operation, certainly we may be a little more liberal in terms of fluid resuscitation of the patient and so, and then we'll progress to concentrate the infusions. Um, we are liberal about fluid management in, in the context of optimizing the patient's conditions and then trying to win the inotropes and vasopressors. And once the hemodynamics have, sta have stabilized, we'll be uh, aggressive in terms of fluid removal. Uh, in terms of the sedation management, you would argue the best sedation is no sedation and <laughs> to try to facilitate uh, ambulation of patients. I might be honest, this is not a post-cardiotomy cardiogenic shock patient, but yes, it's a patient on vino arterial ECMO uh, with peripheral cannulation with the distal reperfusion cannula and so that we were eventually uh, trying to support to bridge to a lung transplant. Uh, there is controversy now back to sedation in terms of the the use uh, and, 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 and and pro of propofol um, uh, with the with the the hypertriglyceridemia and, and 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 so that comes along with it and and and, and uh, many programs are favoring the use more of fentanyl hydromorphone and other um, sedation strategies. Uh, in terms of anticoagulation, the guidelines do support the use of heparin, definitely, but also, the, importantly, uh, to withhold anticoagulation early after surgery until the bleeding has diminished. And they actually mention that it's reasonable to, to, to hold the anticoagulation for up to two or three days. And this is in the context of venoarterial ECMO, even considering central coagulation. Once that the bleeding has control and so, uh, you know, support the, the use of PTT, uh, of, of heparin with a target PTT of roughly 50 to 80. I would argue we are a little more conservative, maybe on the 50 to 70 range, but oftentimes we we, we tolerate um, coagulopathy, certain degree of coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia and are less aggressive anticoagulating the patients. The use of direct thrombin in inhibitors is not uh, directly supported, uh, and some programs are gaining increasing uh, experience. We uh, have adopted it for our um, COVID patients and we, with vino vino segmo and or hybrid configurations, and we've been very happy in terms of a more stable anticoagulation range and in terms of maybe less requirements to, to change the oxygenator, particularly on long ECMO runs. In terms of antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, the guidelines bring up to our attention the, you know, the higher incidence of infections in patients re uh, receiving uh, mechanical circulatory support post-cardiotomy with a 
you know, wide range of, of reports, but certainly those patients with open chest, prolonged mechanical ventilation, multiple cannulations, and so all those are factors that make the patients more prone uh, than a regular operation, cardiac operation to, to, to get infection. And actually about a third of this uh, patients on, on, on mechanical support after postcardiotomy will be attributable to infections. There is limited evidence, so there comes the expert consensus and they support the uh, broad spectrum uh, use of antibiotics uh, uh, and, and considering, of course, the fact that, that there is going to be an inflammatory response related to the ECMO circuit per se and, and the, the heater and cooler may mask a hyperthermia. So we, particularly in patients with open chest, will remain on, on, on wide spectrum antibiotics. Um, in terms of the wound management for open chest, we've learned from actually the experience there at main campus uh, that the, the, the importance of, of um, the negative pressure wound therapy, the vacuum therapy, to facilitate the management of the open wounds, uh, decrease the bleeding, and, and also the, the, this report uh, of over 400 patients proved that it facilitated and was related to improved survival. In terms of LV unloading, uh, we are all familiar uh, with the pressure loops and, and the, the, the effects of ECMO increasing the pressure and, and which may compromise uh, recovery of, of, of myocardial function and the different platforms and strategies to decompress and facilitate recovery. The guidelines uh, go on that and point out the importance uh, of active decompression, particularly in patients that have uh, severe uh, ventricular congestion, you know, uh, of course, as documented by echocardiography and as well as hemodynamic parameters. And this goes specifically on, on specific situations uh, that can, and approaches that can go be applied in patients with different types of mechanical prosthesis on the mitral side, the, 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 the aortic side, in terms of, uh, I think with the timing, we are gonna move forward from here, but basically to describe different strategies for venting and decompressing of the left ventricle that can be, can be applied. And, and to point out that the one that is particularly active is, is certainly the direct venting of the left ventricle with the, with the impeller. And this is uh, more and more common um, in which we see that the, 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 we, we apply the impeller and eventually we have to step up to ECMO or we use the impeller to decompress the left ventricle and it facilitates rapid recovery and winning from ECMO. Here we see in this slide um, provided by Dr. Soltes the benefit uh, of active draining of the left ventricle and how we get back on, on our pressure volume loops to more physiologic parameters. And it's been reported in terms of uh, improving general perfusion of the brain, uh, of, the, of the myocardium in all segments of the myocardium, improving the hemodynamics, as we said, and, include, uh, and even uh, 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 molecular uh, benefits have, have been reported. And, and so we see that patients that receive active LV unloading with the impeller will have better hospital uh, survival. Uh, and we see this in this multicentric um, report from Europe with roughly 700 patients. Uh, this is for cardiogenic shock, not post-cardiotomy shock, but, but, but how the, the use of impeller in concomitant with ECMO facilitated recovery in hospital survival. Now, this is not uh, without uh, co uh, problems, uh, particularly with the femoral impellas uh, that are associated with higher increase of bleeding, ischemia of the access site or the, the, of the, or the limbs, and, and high requirements of renal replacement. <clears throat> More recently, Dr. Istep, uh, Soltes, and, and um, Alfares um, provided this meta-analysis uh, looking at the opportunity of using impelling concomitant with, with ECMO and, and the importance of LV venting uh, in terms of benefit, uh, uh, particularly if applied uh, benefit, survival benefit, particularly if applied um, early uh, after the implementation of support. Uh, 
In terms of the assessment of the cardiac recovery, certainly it's important the adequate uh, support of all the organs to facilitate and, and to reverse uh, the end organ the damage. And when we do our multidisciplinary uh, assessments on, on a daily basis, we certainly assess the patient and all the platforms and, 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 and the inotropic support and so and try to profile and reprofile the, the patient on a daily basis, trying to understand the degree of compromise uh, of each um, chamber, reprofile the patient and get the patient to a more stable condition um, with adequate coupling of the left and right uh, chambers. Uh, the echocardiogram, uh, we are applying it more liberally and has been a, a important in terms of optimizing hemodynamic support and the uh, performance of each device. <clears throat> and then when it comes to winning of ECMO, certainly <clears throat> if the patient <coughs> presents adequate end organ recovery, we're going to try to win and explain that the device. If neuro, they are neurologically intact, but the ventricular contractility remains pure, particularly uh, co direct compromise or univentricular compromise of the left ventricle, we can consider long-term LVAD or eventually heart transplant. And if there is neurologic compromise, we need to think of withdrawal of support. Uh, so certainly the guidelines go back to that and, and support the, the weaning after the patient had been stable for at least 24 hours with good solid mean arterial pressure, low lactate level, optimized uh, ventricular function, ventricular function about 25% and optimized end organ perfusion. And the progressive weaning in the case of the OxyR, but uh, similar to what we do when we win vino vino segmo. Different... Uh, uh, let us say winning uh, strategies and protocols have been uh, de device, uh, described and reported, and this is specifically uh, for post-cardiotomy shock. And this is a situation in which uh, uh, we would want to, to avoid the patient that persists dependent on the drugs, on the devices, and what we do, and, and so uh, without cardiac recovery. So uh, the bridge to long-term mechanical support or heart transplant is an option, and, and, but we know that patients that are bridged to LVAD uh, or eventually to heart transplant from ECMO will present higher mortality. With the new allocation score, uh, I would argue that this is not so true anymore, and we are learning that uh, results and outcomes after heart transplant are improved, but that's probably a different population of patients that the patient in post-cardiotomy shock, indeed. So our experience, brief experience in the past 18 months uh, at Cleveland Clinic, Florida, it's been roughly 14 patients that received uh, ECMO post-cardiotomy shock uh, with mean age of 64. Three of them received eCPR um, in, the, in the ICU in the context of, 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 of different etiologies of cardiac arrest. Uh, and eventually three of them actually had come from outside uh, hospitals. Um, the survival is roughly 36%. Uh, if we don't contemplate the ones that eventually receive eCPR, we are looking at roughly 45%. This is small number, so still a lot of work to do, but just wanted to share uh, the work from Cleveland Clinic Florida. And moving forward, it's important, I think, uh, you know, to be aware the rapid and early detection and rapid progression of, of support in these patients. Definitely communication among teams is critical. Uh, hopefully, as we apply more machine learning and artificial intelligence, we'll be able to early identify the organ's dysfunction and probably will play a big role moving forward. And then the collaboration and, and the participation in different platforms to, to learn, particularly for, for, for I think, uh, a pathology like post-cardiotomy shock that uh, it's very hard to, to, to get uh, big numbers, of course, as you've seen uh, in, the, in, the, in the articles that, that we described. Thank you very much. Um, we had, I had invited uh, Mike um, to present. Uh, I don't know if you would want to move forward with the discussion now, or, or we could have Mike present the study that they have done with the experience at main campus that I think would be great if we can have five additional minutes to, to present that experience.
uh, I'm going to stop uh, sharing my. Yeah, Nico, that, that was a great summary. Um, I think if we have the either Mike Javorski or uh, Mike Tong uh, to be able to share the um, uh, uh, slides here, we can go through those and then uh, open up for discussion after that. Yeah, there we go. I stop presenting. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mike. See if I can present. Uh, can you give me the control? Uh, I think you have it. I stopped presenting, Mike. Mm. It says I wasn't given the. I think you have to oh. allow him to have control and not just stop presenting. So if you request it again, Mike. Uh. I'll see the button to request again. Just give me a second. I'll be <laughs> right with you. Mike, I just changed you to a participant from a guest and see if that works for you. Let me see. There's the only meeting organizers and presenters can share. Mike, do you want to kick the slides to one of us and we can put them up? Yeah. Who should I send to? I listen. Uh, you can forward to me. Um, let me. Yeah. Try to open them up. <clears throat> so, Mike, check again. I just did something else to your teams that should allow you to present now. At least that's what it told me. Make a presenter. Change. You think we figure this out but at the end of COVID? So um, technical glitches. Let me call my son. Maybe he'll let me know how to do it. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, so. Email it to me to email it to you. The, Yeah, just go ahead and email it to me, Mike, and I can put it up. OK. I guess in the meantime, we can talk or you guys can discuss. Well, actually, Nico, I'll ask you a question. Um, yeah, partly based on your experience uh, uh, that you presented at Florida. So uh, when you get a a transfer call or a phone call from an outside hospital from uh, uh, with a patient that's got postcardiotomy shock. You know, sometimes the phone calls come from the operating room. How do you triage and select what might be a futile case from a case where there potentially could be some benefit? So that's a great question, and it's uh, nowadays, you know, certainly the, we go through the so we have the. 24-7 shock line that is progressively being adopted. Uh, so we discuss immediately with as a group. Most of us, most of the time is two or three of us discussing, you know, someone from heart failure, uh, from the ICU, and, and, and from uh, cardiac surgery. Uh, and and so definitely up front that you know we'll have that discussion and, and we'll try to figure if this is reasonable and viable. If, if we understand it is, uh, we we'll progress to try to get them a bed. Um, let me see if the, you can see on the screen, Mike. Uh, sorry. Can you see the screen? I was trying to share your presentation. Uh, now, the, the challenge comes uh, when the transfer is delayed, and that's oftentimes the case. And so we are learning that we need reassessment maybe every 12 hours, you know, and, 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 and we can always consider calling it out, uh, calling it out. And we are learning to do that after you get burned once or twice. You know, these patients are sick. They are very dynamic. And what you discuss at 8 a.m. may not be the case at 8 p.m. when the patient may be coming over. So we're trying to to avoid th those situations. Would you want 
him to go ahead. And yeah, um, Mike, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, yeah, we'll sure, I can give a, you know, be open. I can give a abbreviated version of it, but uh, you know, we started with a case. Um, basically, it's a 65 year old male with a low ejection fraction and the usual risk factors for coronary artery disease. Go to the next slide. Uh, he presented with three vessel coronary artery disease. Um, you can see the targets here. A pretty pretty poor target on the right. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, his PET scan showed uh, overall viable myocardium, but some hibernating myocardium, but no scar. Go to the next slide. He had a right heart cath preoperatively, and he had a low cardiac index and a high wedge pressure, which is indicative of uh, uh, heart failure. Uh, but his right heart function was preserved. So uh, this is the... Uh, the uh, patient presentation overall, low EF, but with coronary disease and the Bible myocardium. Uh, so next slide, uh, how should we proceed? Should he get a high-risk cabbage, or should he go down the uh, heart failure pathway to an LVAD or heart transplant? Um, and so the dilemma here is that patients with low ejection fraction um, may benefit from uh, revascularization. However, the low ejection fraction puts them at higher risk for postcardiotomy, cardiogenic shock, uh, which we've talked about, PCCS, and this is, has a high mortality. Uh, to help protect these patients, um, here we we uh, we have this Impella backup plan, which is used for patients deemed high risk. Before going on to carbapenem bypass, the axillary artery is exposed and a graft is sewn to the artery. When weaning from carbapenem bypass, the heart function pressors and inotropes are assessed for the need for an Impella or other support like ECMO. Uh, our study sought to investigate these types of patients to identify the predictors of PCCS. Uh, and additionally, we looked at the ejection fraction over time. Next slide. So this was a retrospective review of 238 patients from 2017 to 19 that underwent non-LVED non-transplant surgery. And the inclusion criteria was ejection fraction less than 30 or EF less than 35 with at least significant MR. And uh, the patients were put into two categories, in pellet backup or not. And they were, they were um, the surgeon, if the surgeon felt that they were at high risk for PCCS, they were put in this impella backup category. But there was no formal selection. Uh, and this alone was one of the reasons why we are doing this study. So the mean age was 64 years old. The average, the mean EF was 25%. Uh, and a lot of these patients had... Um, uh, history of myocardial infarction. And the primary outcome was PCCS, which was defined as the need for intra-op or post-op ECMO or Impella, or um, like Dr. Brazi was talking about the VIS score, we defined it, uh, PCCS as a VIS above 25, which uh, there's not really a definition in the literature, so we kind of went with this definition after looking at, after evaluating things. And uh, this shows the breakdown of the two groups the Impella backup groups, um, the majority of patients with PCS were treated with an Impella. Um, or, sorry, in this group, um, the Impella backup plan, 40% of patients had PCCS, which is a lot higher than the non-Impella group. And the next slide shows the breakdown of uh, what support they received. Most of the patients in the Impella backup group got an Impella and not an ECMO. Um, and there was more ECMO use in the non impella backup group. Um, however, they were about the same. And then this was the overall mortality. The mortality in the PCCS group uh, was actually better than what, what has been reported. It was like 4.6%. In the non-PCCS group, in those patients that didn't get PCS, it was 0.6. And then overall, it was 1.6 in this low ejection fraction group. And then next, we'll discuss some of the predictive factors that we found. Um, so we use random forest analysis to look at uh, to look at some of these factors. The top variables that we identified were actually uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, PAPI, and cardiac index. Uh, all all get gotten from a right heart cath pre-op. Next slide. Um, and so this this shows. Um, some of the correlation between the wedge pressure as it gets above 19, uh, the risk for PCCS goes up. And then the next slide shows 
with a lower PAPI, um, which is a measure of the right heart function, was associated with a higher uh, probability of PCCS. And the next slide, it shows that a cardiac index below 2.4 pre-op, uh, you have a higher risk of PCCS. And so we also looked at viability testing, and uh, it actually did not, it was not a, a shown to be a predictor of uh, PCCS. Next. And then lastly, the uh, ejection fraction post-op. So if you give these patients a chance, you know, a lot of these patients will do, uh, um, will have improvement in the ejection fraction with the, with the proper support post-operatively, whether it's with Impella or ECMO. And then, uh, in conclusion, you know, a lot of these patients developed PCCS, but their mortality was low. The preoperative right heart cath seems to be an important tool. Um, you know, there wasn't a very strong predictive. Um, you know, there's no p value for the uh, for the uh, random force analysis, but but these were predictors, even though they might be small. They it might be one piece of the puzzle that might be useful to get preoperatively. And then you can show an ejection fraction improvement. And then the patient that we talked about, he, he received a cabbage and Impella 5.0. Uh, the Impella was removed post up day five and he was discharged post up day 13. Um, and the next slide shows his ejection fraction improvement 1.5 years out. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. That's quite impressive case. Uh, and I think it's a, a, a great, uh, um, I, I was glad when I saw your abstract um, uh, on Friday and I, I missed the presentation as I, I was in the operating room, but uh, I think this is taking this strategy that you guys are applying now with Impella back up, certainly taking all these concepts that, that we've been discussed and, and, and being very proactive using the, 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 the most modern uh, approach, I would say with early application and certainly reflects in the results. So I, one comment I want to make is the following. So if uh, a patient with a low ejection fraction makes a planned trip to the operating room, um, you know, if you dial back 10, 10 years ago, for example, where uh, perhaps, uh, you know, we didn't have uh, Impella 5, we didn't have Impella 5.5 uh, or CP even, Really what you were talking about was uh, if you were unlucky enough to have post-cardiotomy shock after uh, the pump run, uh, ECMO was really uh, sort of your main way to get out of the operating room aside from using a balloon pump and inotropes and you know nitric oxide or Velitri or uh, uh, other um, uh, measures. Uh, so I'm wondering two things that uh, may have occurred over time. Uh, one is that uh, you know, the consequences of having a death in the operating room after a cardiac case are pretty significant. So uh, I think that in some cases, VA ECMO is installed just to get out of the operating room. And in some of those cases, there may or may not be a realistic uh, 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 prospect for the patient to uh, recover or improve, um, although in some cases there might be. Um, and as the use of devices like Impella 5 or more recently Impella 5.5 have increased. Um, you know, I wonder if there will be more planned use of devices like the 5.5, um, and, um, and, and that may actually make the use of VA ECMO unnecessary. Uh, Nico, what, what's at Cleveland Clinic Florida, uh, mm -hmm. what is the approach to, let's say, a low EF cabbage with borderline targets where you know, a balloon pump may not be enough at the end. Well, and, and, and that's the approach we are adopting. Um, so far, our experience has been limited, of course. Remember, our volumes are, 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 are smaller, right? But um, we did the one case uh, last year, uh, you know, patient with low EF, not a candidate for, for transplant or advanced support, with peripheral vascular disease, and so came with decompensated sort of heart failure, stabilized him, optimized his condition, placed him on an impella pre-op, and then within three, four days, uh, took him for cabbage. Uh, we have done the studies. He was, he had poor vessels actually, but was ended up being the only option. 
we had to do and endarterectomies and so on. So we are adopting this approach. We discussed with Ed and the team in, in Ohio, and, and so we try to, to stay sort of current and, and, and adopt, you know, similar strategies. Uh, the other things that stood out to me uh, from your slides were the strikingly high mortality associated with postcardiotomy shock, no matter what you do, which is, you know, as Mike quoted in his slides, 50 to 70 percent. Um, and perhaps that will evolve in a positive direction uh, in future years, but it's still extraordinarily high. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, that is really the mortality associated with eCPR. So, Correct. And yeah. that's why I took the, I'm sorry, uh, James, but I'm glad you bring it up. That's why I use the first part of the, the, the discussion to go over general concepts of cardiogenic shock and the persistent high mortality in non-operative patients, MI and so, roughly of 50%. And, and that's why I think it's critical, the, and, and, and the classification, the sky classification of cardiogenic shock. So, what they did, what, for example, Mike da, did in, in his case, identify the patient stage one at risk or eventually stage two, and then go to the OR and rapidly implement, you know, the, 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 the therapy, the mechanical support, and keep the patient there before progressing and starting with support in a stage D or, or C or E, excuse me, D or E. And so I think that's where we have the opportunity. We are going to continue to to operate on sick patients, maybe elderly, and I'm afraid we are going to continue to support patients to get them out of the OR. Uh, so, you know, there is only a possibility. Of, I mean, eventually the, the opportunity also is, is to, you know, not every patient has to go through the OR. Eventually, you know, that's where, you know, selection of the patients uh, play a role and, yeah. and the use of, of alternative yeah. therapy. So, uh, Nico, one more question for you, and then Penny has her hand up. So, yeah, uh, Nico, I, I think, uh, you know, you pointed out some of the differences between the peripheral versus central cannulation uh, and some of the differences in outcomes there. But, you know, if the 30-day mortality is similar um, at the end of the day, how much does it matter? And do you think that if you have a surgical case where you're coming out of the OR on central VA ECMO, is there a higher stroke risk associated with that configuration? Uh, they did in the, in the sub-analysis, uh, they, they do, uh, you know, I, I don't know that even the numbers, even though the numbers were large, when you look at 0.92, you know, uh, RR for, for peripheral. Uh, I don't know that I'm still not completely convinced that, for example, I would put a patient on peripheral ECMO. I think, you know, there is opportunity to stabilize them on central ECMO and then eventually think of, of transitioning to peripheral ECMO. Uh, you know, if patients linger a little longer, the average day of support we didn't discuss, but was roughly 10 days. And so if the patients linger longer on, on ECMO, then there is opportunity three, four, five days after the operation to transition to peripheral ECMO, maybe with an axillary graft, and, uh, and, and at the time close the chest. Mm -hmm. Okay, Penny, you're up. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Dr. Berzi. That was extremely comprehensive in terms of review. And this question goes actually to both you and Mike, because Mike, um, in your data that you showed, um, I just noticed a marked difference in terms of mortality for your postcardiotomy shock patient. And I think it goes back to what Dr. Brosey said in terms of us figuring out what a definition is. And I know the more contemporary definition that you have is just from a few years ago. I'm wondering what kind of definition you use, Mike, in terms of thinking about who are your patients? Do they truly qualify as, you know, having shock by what definition that you elect to put in an impella? As I think about kind of judicious use of resource and who are the patients that we actually supply with support as you're at that cusp of trying to get them off of cardiopulmonary bypass, um, figuring out who that is um, so that you can create uh, actually established guidelines about who are your appropriate candidates, I think is important. All right. That's a good question. Um, so for, for our study, we defined uh, PCCS as uh, those that needed ECMO or Impella perioperative or in the 
uh, intraop or postoperatively. And those that got impella in the OR, I was up to the surgeon's discretion on whether that or not they needed it. So if they were coming off pump and they were on a lot of inotropes, that's a t- typical scenario. Um, but we don't have the exact inotropes and, and situations to report. What we do have is we reported their first uh, inotropes they were on when they got to the ICU. And um, from that, we calculated the vasoactive inotropic score. And we we decided that 25 was the cutoff for, for those that weren't on any support, that that would be the... Um, the cutoff and an example of someone on uh, uh, with a VIS of 25 is um, so levo of eight or 0.1, uh, vaso of 0.05, epi of six, and melanone of 0.25. So uh, two inotropes and two pressors most of the time. Um, and now looking through the literature, there's not really that I found. I don't know if you found Dr. Brazi like a VIS score that defined PCCS. Um, so we kind of um, looked at the numbers and decided, came up with this this number. Um, it might be more than twenty five, but you know we thought that twenty five was a good good estimate. So, so there is no, and and that's why I, I also place a slide uh, about the different scores that we are developed over the last ten years. I think it continues to be elusive, and that's where I think uh, eventually machine learning, eventually these kind of things will come into play and give us a, 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 a you know a better idea will allow us to to do a more objective assessment yeah it seems like most of the people a lot of the studies they define it as when you go on ECMO support um, which is which is kind of late most people are put on ECMO late in the game and one of the takeaways I got from Dr. Bazi's talk is that the guidelines actually say you should put someone consider putting someone on when your lactate like hasn't even reached four yet, which is pretty interesting. So um, that, that'll be something that I'll think about, and you know, as a resident. But um, you know, uh, so uh, I think our mortality was maybe lower because we were using devices earlier on when they were first coming off pump, and um, like Dr. Bazi was saying, they're in the OR and they're being perfused. They're not they're not having any hypoperfusion issues yet. And so maybe that's key to use it earlier. Mm-hmm. And Mike, Mike, also your uh, your series, there were all in-house patients, right? No out of hospital um uh postcardiotomy shock uh, cases. I feel like any series that has a mixture, those outside cases are not only um uh you know, the timing of ECMO may or may not be done at an early time point. There's also a period of waiting for transport. There's a transport, and then there's a figuring out phase once they get to, uh, you know, the receiving hospital. So I feel like those cases are, um, you know, in a uh, usually a worse bucket than um, those that are sort of smoothly transitioned within the same hospital to ECMO support. Yeah, right. Go ahead, Mike, please. Yeah, yeah, all of them were, were done in, in-house, so none of them were transfers. Um, and can I ask you, did you have patients uh, after aortic procedures included in your series? Yes, so uh, I think about 10% had some type of aortic procedure. Okay. Um, yeah. Are there a number of intensivists on the line um, or... Um, uh, uh, our ICU uh, CTA and uh, NP staff, and um, are there any comments from the um, intensivist uh, audience here? Uh, let's say you know we have patients that have either central or peripheral cannulation for PCCS, VA ECMO. Um, you know, any, any comments about uh, you know the central versus peripheral cannulation and some of the uh, ongoing care um, in the ICU uh, perspectives? Hi guys, uh, it's Dr. Uday. Uh, echoing the comments earlier, Dr. Brozzi, really a comprehensive review, thank you for that. Um, I don't think that it matters in terms of much more limitations in terms of moving them 
um, for any reason because you just don't have that uh, margin of error. So compared to a patient who are peripherally cannulated, if you needed to move them in any way for anything. So I think that's much the limitation with those uh, patients. The other comment I wanted to add was um, you know, there's very little evidence for <laughs> antimicrobial prophylactic prophylaxis for these patients when they're open chest. Uh, a few years ago, we looked at, at the main campus, we looked at patients who have been open chest. These were not necessarily patients on ECMO, just patients who were uh, left open for delayed closure for any number of reasons, and looked at what their outcomes had been with the different types of antimicrobial prophylaxis. So whether they had broad spectrum or just narrow spectrum, uh, cefazolin or vancomycin. And we didn't find any difference. I don't remember the total numbers of patients. So we didn't find any difference um, in terms of uh, subsequent infections. And uh, for most of our patients, I think we stopped. There was a variety of practice back then. Um, and some antibiotics would continue for a few days after closure, depending on whether there were any other signs of infection. But for the most part, we would stop them 24 hours after. But would you... I mean, would you have patients with open chest and, and no antibiotic coverage, or, or you're just referring to the spectrum? Uh, yeah, spec to the spectrum. Not, not. Uh, I mean, there was, there were no patients that did not have coverage. So, um, rather than expanding from the typical skin flora coverage that would be used for elective surgery to I, uh, uh, broad spectrum, we just we found that there was no difference. So, I think. Considering the principles of uh, antibiotic stewardship, a risk of um, of uh, uh, what do you call it, C. diff, colitis, and um, <clears throat> resistance, I, I think the best evidence from what we saw was stick with whatever you started with in the operating room. No need. There was no indication to expand to broad spectrum. Now, if any other signs of um, super infection came out, of course, you adjusted to that. Okay, we're running uh, a little past 7.15. Uh, Pat, if you're uh, still on the line, you have any comments from the perfusionist perspective? Postcardiotomy shock, peripheral versus uh, central candulation? No, I think from our standpoint, it's, it's pretty straightforward either way. Um, so it doesn't change a whole lot for us. Okay. Uh, Nico and Mike, uh, you want to wrap up any other uh, uh, final closing thoughts? Mike, why don't you go first and then Nico second? Obviously, huge mortality with this population, a lot of room for improvement. Yeah, I just want to thank Dr. Brazi for inviting me to talk. Um, yeah, I think the Impella um, may improve these outcomes of PCCS and um, evaluating for who should get the Impella back up. Uh, one of the tools seems to be the right heart cast preoperatively to look at the wedge pressure and the PAPI. Um, that'll be interesting going forward to look at. Definitely. Okay, no, I just want to thank, uh, you know, uh, uh, thank you, James, uh, Penny, and, and, and uh, Alex for the opportunity to participate. Uh, again, as we strive to integrate service lines across the enterprise, these initiatives are critical and, and we are glad to be able to participate and collaborate on, on all these initiatives. All right. Great presentation, uh, Nico and Mike. Appreciate everybody's involvement today. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.